Ted Fleming joins me this week to talk about making non-alcoholic beer. This is Beersmith Podcast number 213. This is Beersmith Podcast number 213, and it's early April 2020. Ted Fleming joins me this week to talk about making non-alcoholic beers at home. Thank you to this week's sponsor is Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Every issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine is packed with articles for homebrewers and beer lovers. They're currently offering 20% off their all-access subscription pass. With access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com slash beersmith to get your all-access pass today. And also the Brew Commander, the new complete brew house controller from Blickman Engineering, available in electric and gas propane models. This patent-pending Brew Commander is a high-quality brew house controller with exact precision and the ultimate in flexibility. Whether integrated or freestanding, the Brew Commander offers automated step mashing, boil timers, and amazing advanced settings. Whatever your setup, the Brew Commander offers precision temperature control and perfect repeatability. Command your brew day with a new Brew Commander from Blickman Engineering. Visit BlickmanEngineering.com for more information. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, I urge you to give Beersmith 3 Brewing Software a try. Beersmith 3 adds mead, wine, and cider recipe support to the Beersmith platform, along with new integrated water profile and mash pH tools. Dozens of new features, including cloud folders, updated databases, support for fruit, juice, and honey, as well as new Whirlpool hop options. Download your free 21-day trial today from beersmith.com and give it a try. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, I welcome Ted Fleming. Ted is the founder of Partake Brewing in Toronto, where he specializes in creating a wide variety of creative non-alcoholic beers. Uh, since then, Ted's also won a number of awards in the non-alcoholic category at the World Beard Awards. Ted, it's uh, great to have you on the show. How you doing, man? I'm doing pretty well. Thanks for having me on, Brad. <laughs> so you're uh, sequestered up in, uh, let's see, somewhere in Western Canada, I think, right? Yes, in Calgary, Alberta. That's a nice area, though. Beautiful, huh? It's beautiful, except uh, right now it's uh, below zero and we're still getting snow. So uh. <laughs> looking forward to spring. Well, I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about your story, uh, which got you into non-alcoholic beer brewing. Uh, how, did, how did all that happen? Yeah, so my story goes back to about 2005. Um, at that point, I was in my mid-20s, really getting into the craft beer scene. I was still uh, playing a lot of sports and drinking beer was sort of part of that, uh, that experience and that socializing. And unfortunately for me, I was diagnosed with with Crohn's disease about that time. And that led to a bunch of changes in my life around diet and lifestyle. And one of the more specific things that came out of that was I made a decision to give up alcohol. And uh, that was very difficult. And at that time, there weren't really great options there. So uh, I struggled with that. And, and um, you know, I, I, I tried the non-alcoholic beers that were available at the time. And Ultimately, I found myself kind of drifting back towards alcoholic beer because I just wasn't able to replicate the taste experience, the variety, and really on premise, there was there was very few bars or restaurants carrying non-alcoholic beer at that time as well. And so, you know, it was it was very difficult for me to um, um, kind of live that lifestyle I was aspiring to uh, without a great alternative. And uh, when you switch to non-alcoholic beers, of course, they have uh, kind of a poor reputation with beer drinkers. Um, you know, what, what was available on the commercial market? Were there anybody, was anybody making really good on non-alcoholic beer? I think there, there was definitely some innovation happening and some, some breadth of style in Europe. But here in North America, you know, we had O'Doul's. Um, yeah, you I had think most, a lot of us have tried O'Doul's over the years, so... Yeah, so things that, you know, they're, I wouldn't say they're bad, but I, I wouldn't say they're good either. And there really was nothing in terms of variety. So everything was more or less a lager in terms of style. So um, for someone coming from craft beer, it was, it was uh, very difficult to, um, to go to that. Hmm. And as I understand, you uh, started a website first, uh, making, I, I guess you're selling commercial non-alcoholic beers. Is that what you're doing first? 
Yeah, so in sort of late 2013, as sort of I wanted to really actually do something to try and change the non-alcoholic uh, beer situation, and I knew, you know, I knew my my experience, and I knew there'd be other people out there. So I just said, "Hey, let's try this. We'll we'll bring together within a website a bunch of the European non-alcoholic beers that." Early on, they were already being imported into the Toronto area, which was where I lived at that time. And we brought them all into one location that people could could buy the variety from. And that sort of uh, grew from there to the point where we were doing our own importing from Europe. I think we got up to about 25 different uh, types of non-alcoholic beer in that online store. And we'd also expanded it to non-alcoholic wines and ciders and even spirits and uh and then sort of in the sort of 2016 we kind of you know reevaluated that business and and particularly because we were in Canada we had trouble accessing the US market because of the the rules around the FDA and labeling that we didn't have control of um we decided to pivot and create our own brand which would get us around some of the issues we were experiencing in, in trying to grow that online store. Interesting. Um, can you talk for a minute about the European beers and what made them different from something like Odul's here? Well, I think, I think largely um, the big difference was style. Um, there were, there were dark beers available through in Europe. There were wheat beers uh, very common and, and quite well-made. And so we were able to expand the the flavor profile within non-alk um, with those beers. Obviously, they had a bit more of a European um, uh, fla- flavors to them. They, there weren't the the North American craft styles, and that sort of you know led to the creation of Partake to to um, make non-alcoholic beers in more of a North American style of craft, but. Um, you know, they, they certainly, uh, the Europeans were making some great tasting non-alcoholic beer. And a lot of them were coming from, uh, breweries that were, uh, well-established and had uh, great brand reputation. And so, you know, that was a, it was an easy sell for people that were predisposed to non-alcoholic beer, having brands that people were familiar with. So what kind of styles were they working in? Just, a, just as a comparison. <laughs> Yeah, well, certainly they had uh, lagers, uh, more so the Pilsner style of, of lager. Um, wheat beers were quite common um, from Germany, and they were made uh, quite nicely. So there were some great products that were wheat beers that were were virtually indistinguishable from the alcoholic versions of those same beers. Wow. Um, definitely found some darker beers uh, from Europe as well. Um Tended to some degree, the, the European beers I found tend to be uh, a little bit sweeter than, um, in, at least in the non-alcoholic side of things, versus what a typical North American beer consumer would be. Um, their palates would be adjusted towards. And then you mentioned it was a combination of things that brought you, brought you into uh, ultimately creating Partake. Yeah, so it was. Um, you know, we obviously got our, our feet wet and, and, and built up a community through the online store, which gave us the confidence to say, hey, there's there's actually something here as a, as a business. And then as we built that customer base, we started to hear from them asking, hey, can you get a non-alcoholic beer from craft brewers? Can you get an IPA? Can you get uh, a stout? Um, and we tried to source those. And, you know, <laughs> to be honest, we... Uh, sometimes got laughed at and oftentimes said, you know, there's, there's no market there for, for non-alcoholic beer. So, you know, Mm -hmm. that was really kind of what pushed us into doing it ourselves in combination with some of the struggles we were having with, with building a business in Canada and trying to service U S customers. And, you know, there was a lot of frustration from our U S customers because they couldn't understand why we couldn't ship across the border. And, uh, there are a lot of regulatory reasons for that. So um, is, it, is, it, is it because non-alcoholic beer is treated like a food product or is it a, how does that work? Yeah, well, it's, it, it, uh, it's touched on by both the FDA and the TTB, which, which makes it a bit, uh, a bit tricky, but also we, we didn't the have be, control. The best of both worlds, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes, <laughs> something like that. Um, <laughs> 
but ultimately it came down to we did not have control over the labeling of the products and so for us to go and talk to a brewery and say hey can you can you redesign your label so that we can sell into the US they just didn't want to have that conversation with us so we yeah. you know realized we had to just own that process ourselves with our own product so uh so you opened this brewery in in Toronto right um correct and and can you tell us a little bit about that process of going and actually trying to raise the funding for a non-alcoholic brewery and open your own uh, brewery? Yeah, so we we had um, obviously the base business, which was the online business to start with, and that was fundamental in us taking this next step. And so what we did was we we did a crowdfunding campaign on Kickstarter, and we were able to raise thirty thousand dollars in our campaign, which was enough for us to do um, a 50 barrel batch. And, um, you know, at least with the money in the bank, we were able to have a, uh, conversation with brewers, although, you know, a lot of them wanted minimum, minimum requirements and, and so on, which at the time was a little bit, uh, nerve wracking for me, but, uh, it's, it's funny today we do, we do more production in a week than those, uh, those annual, commitments i was being asked to do which were making so, me nervous I, were you years. looking at gypsy brewing at this point i guess you were trying to get other breweries to make the beer for you or how does that work yeah we we were looking to work with a, a partner contract brewery um you know thirty thousand dollars is not going to get <laughs> get you a, a real brewery and and so we we took that mindset that we could we could work with a with an existing brewery if they had the right technical um uh, know-how and expertise to, uh, mm-hmm. to work with us with our specific process. So Ted, I, I know you use some proprietary ingredients and techniques, but can you explain the basis pro- basic process of how you even make non-alcoholic beer? I'm not sure a lot of people are familiar with it. Sure. So generally speaking, there are, are two, uh, methods for making non-alcoholic beer. One is called arrested fermentation where uh, in a brewery you would have a lot of uh, process control around the temperature of your wort and you would be able to cool down that wort to the point where the yeast is deactivated before it uh, metabolizes um, the sugars into alcohol beyond half a percent. Um, I think this method is used a lot more in Europe um, for, for, for uh, those breweries. And then I think in North America, the, the method that's used more often is a physical separation. Um, some of the larger brewers have the CapEx to, to, to buy a, a membrane filtration system. But I think um, for a home brewer and for smaller breweries, uh, a thermal separation is probably uh, the method of choice. And that occurs because obviously there's a, um, a temperature difference in terms of where alcohol boils and where water boils. Mm-hmm. And so you can, you can separate the alcohol out from the, the beer by uh, bringing up to about uh, 70, 70 degrees uh, centigrade. Right. So, I mean, basically you're boiling off the alcohol, but leaving the rest of the ingredients there, right? Correct. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I haven't heard much about arrested fermentation. So maybe can we explore that for just a minute? What, um, how does that work? Because a half a percent alcohol is not much, so you're not really fermenting much at all there. Right. So you, you tend to end up with um, slightly sweeter beers, and I, I think I mentioned that earlier with with um, that being a bit of a characteristic of the European non-alc beers, and I think that's a, that's a function of the arrested fermentation method where you are getting some of the characteristic from fermentation, but you're also leaving a lot of the sugars unfermented in, in the beer and therefore, you get a, a higher calorie, uh, sweeter uh, style of beer. So you must start with a fairly low gravity beer to start with, then, right? If you're going to only ferment it to a half a percent or something like that, right? Yeah, I think they they uh, they tend to end up with lower gravity to begin with, but they end up uh, if they were to fully ferment it, they might end up at a three percent uh, finished beer. And you mentioned they chill it down, and then do they use either some kind of uh, something to kill off the yeast, or do they separate the yeast at that point? How does that work? I think generally filtration is what's used, but uh, I'm sure there are some other methods to, depending on the brewery. Yeah, I would say it's sulfates and sorbates or something to kill it off, maybe. Um, interesting. Um, 
As I understand it, the brewing and fermenting process is, is much the same as regular beer, though, especially when you're using the, the separation method, which I think is what, what uh, probably more practical for home brewers, right? Yeah, that, some of our early experimentation was around um, brewing a, f- a fully 5% beer, um, splitting that batch, and then having a uh, you know one uh, control sample, and then doing some dealkalization on the the other half of the beer and doing several iterations of that to see how close we could approximate one to the other. So if I wanted to try this at home, I could make a beer, uh, probably of any style, right? And then literally just ferment it out, finish that beer, and then uh, uh, heat it to 70 degrees C, boil off the alcohol, and I'd have my non-alcoholic beer, right? Yeah, I think that's the simplest method. I think you're seeing some people doing experimentation with, um, depending on their, their level of technical sophistication, um, applying a vacuum uh, to the beer and being able to, to boil off the alcohol at a lower temperature and then being, you know, obviously that's a bit gentler on the, uh, the remaining beer. Um, but at the most basic level, yeah, boiling off the alcohol uh, after you make a, a 5% beer is, is probably the simplest method. Interesting. And what does that do to the flavor of the beer? Uh, it's not the best. Um, <laughs> so, you know, you, you generally wouldn't cook your beer afterwards, uh, without, without this as a, uh, an I, outcome you were I assume going it does for. more, I assume it does more than just boil off the alcohol, right? Yeah. There's definitely a, a, a change in the flavor to the beer that, uh, that occurs from this. Um, and that's why you're seeing people go, um, to some of the vacuum assisted um, thermal separation and also to the membrane uh, style of separation that doesn't heat up the beer. Hmm. But I mean, this is something I could try at home, right? And it would work, uh, assume it would work just fine, right? Yeah, it's it's the simplest method from a home brewer's perspective and and a way to get started. And, and from there, I know home brewers are very... Uh, creative and so i'm sure people will come up with some some other ways to improve that process but i think as a starting point that's uh that's where i would start and that's where we did start now heating the beer obviously degrades it so is there is there a particular style that might work better for example uh you know if i made a dark beer is it going to survive better uh the heating or not um we we've been able to make non-alcoholic beer across a variety of styles. Now our, our method had evolved by the time we, we branched out. Um, but we started with, with an IPA, um, from a, from a home brewing desktop perspective. Um, Mm -hmm. so, you know, I, I can't speak to whether there's one style that's better than the other at the, at the desktop level. Um, so yeah, I, I, yeah, I can't, I can't really weigh in on that, on that one. Okay. Uh, so aside from, you know, some, you know, obviously there's a number of issues that come from heating the beer up. Uh, is there anything that, that would help uh, make the beer, you know, it, 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 what do you lose by, by just losing the alcohol itself? In, well, in terms of the flavor you, profile, I mean. Yeah, you definitely lose some body in the beer. It's, uh, it becomes a bit lighter. And I think the the real trick is, is balance and you know as we we've grown into a commercial company and uh doing batches on a commercial scale uh i use the word um delicate um you know there's there's nowhere really for imperfections to hide and so you know i think you have to be realistic if you're a home brewer and making non-alcoholic beer there's going to be there's going to be some things that if you're if you're really into off flavors um there may be some things that uh stick out to you um but i think you have to keep keep an open mind and and uh be able to accept it uh for what it is so what are some of the typical off flavors i might see in a say a homemade uh (laughs) non-alcoholic beer Uh, some of the traditional off flavors yeah you're you're getting a bit beyond my uh my my level of expertise here but uh um you know, I, I think there's definitely some components to flavor, particularly from the, the heating aspect that, uh, uh, that, heating, are, heating, that are noticeable. Heating, of course, prematurely ages the beer. I mean, that's that's what a lot of breweries do to, to simulate aging of their beer. They heat it, right? 
yeah. So you, I, I think part of that would be some oxidized flavors within that. Um, but uh, the other specific off flavors, um, you know, I think it may be specific to uh, the style or just the home brewing setup. Um, but you are you are definitely subjecting the beer to a lot more stress mm-hmm. uh, than you normally would. Um, and of course you mentioned the trick is to create the right flavor balance, uh, in the absence of alcohol. And again, without revealing too much about your process, are there some tricks or, or, or things we can do to, to help, uh, manage the flavor of the beer as, as we go through this process? Uh, you know, I, I think the big thing for us was, and this was for me in particular was I was really, I was willing to try anything Yeah, and I, I wasn't holding myself to uh, a certain beer standard. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was just saying, can I just make something that I enjoy? And I think that was, that allowed us to overcome some of the early failures really in the beer. If you, if you were to, if you were to view it as a, as a beer judge. Um, So I I think, you know, having an open mind about what you're creating is, uh, is important and not holding it to the same standard and i think as you iterate over time you'll improve on that and you know i think we've created a product that's that's quite enjoyable in and of itself uh, if you just allow yourself to enjoy it now how many uh how many batches i mean you're working on a pilot brewery or something how did you go through this process of iterating and experimenting and coming up with new techniques uh in your own your own business yeah, so before uh, before we had our own brand and I was still operating the online store, I connected with a friend of mine who was a he was a very uh, accomplished home brewer, and uh, the backstory on that was I I bribed him with as much alcoholic beer as he needed um, during the time that he was devoting his system to making non alcoholic beer. So that was a that was a good trade for me. So were you working um, on a, what size homebrew system were you working on? It was a uh, 10, 10 liter system. Uh huh. So not yeah. That's that's pretty small actually, right? Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah. So we, so we what poured, was that we like? What were those of, early days of playing playing with different batches? We uh, we threw a lot down the sink. Did you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was there were some uh, misses, and then there were some very big misses. Um, some stuff was just undrinkable, but, uh, you know, I, I'm an engineer by, by training. And so I have a bit of a, a tinkering and, uh, you know, um, iterate, iterative, um, mindset. So I think we, we were, I was in it for the long haul and, and, uh, was willing to fail many times in order to get something that was, uh, that was, uh, reasonable and something that we could take and, and improve upon. So how many batches did it take to get something uh, drinkable? Uh, I'd say we probably did about 20 or 30 batches and, and maybe, maybe a half dozen were okay. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. That's a pretty good percentage. Yeah. That's not bad. Um, well, pretty interesting. Uh, so you went through this process, were you building new equipment at the time? I mean, did you build some kind of a Rube Goldberg setup to make this work? Um, we, at that point, because we, because we had an existing business, we were able to talk to some, um, local colleges and, and one, one in particular had just received a, a big, uh, funding, a big amount of funding to, to build a pilot brewery system. And so we were connected with them and were able to take some of our desktop work to them and, uh, through the college, they were able to hire some real industry experts that were able to kind of deconstruct what we were doing on a desktop level and and uh, scale it to a, a, another size, which was 50, 50 liters, and bring a level of technical expertise that would allow it to be scaled to commercial. So that was that was a critical step for us in in being able to take it from a homebrew level to a commercial level. So when you, uh, you, you know, you're working on this university system and when you stepped up to making the, the full size batches, were you gypsy brewing again at this time or did you actually go into your own facility? Yeah. So we, one of the design criteria for us was, was developing a process and recipes that would be able to go into a, um, 
commercial system mm-hmm. that required a some capex and some nuances to make our product, but that that weren't kind of deal breakers for those those breweries, and so that was part of our original design criteria, and we were able to we were able to accomplish that and work with some breweries that were kind of at least a little forward looking and and open to us you know working with a company with more or less an unproven um brand and in it and in a category that was still in its uh, infancy here in north america so you're able to do that and i, I don't know that you bottle the initial release or or because it sounds like you didn't have a premises yet we we uh we've been in cans from the the get-go okay. um you know the the we now have painted cans and we buy much larger runs but you know early on it was just a a label and someone had done some work on Photoshop and printed labels. So it was quite rudimentary at the, at the beginning. But uh, one of the learnings we had from running our online business and because most of our early output was going to be sold through our online store, we recognized that uh, shipping glass uh, was not the way to go. Yeah. And so that's why cans were from day one. That was a, a requirement for us. And of course, bottling or, or canning can be a challenge since you killed off all the yeast. I well, you know, I, I know you're forced carbonating, but um, you know, from working at home with a non-alcoholic beer, do you recommend adding more yeast or sugar, or how do we? How do you? How, what do you recommend for bottling? Well, I, th- I think for the home brewer, you know, you're not you're not being uh, held to the same standard that we are as a commercial brewery. If you go above 05 percent, you know, you're not. Um, your product is not, uh, worthless to you. Yeah. Um, it is to us, um, cause we can't sell it if it's above 0.5. So, so obviously um, you keg and force carbonate. Yeah. Yeah. So I think for a home brewer, if, if you're, you know, if, if you're not as, uh, if that 0.5% isn't as critical, you can, you can bottle carbonate it and you'll, you'll probably go over the 0.5% alcohol, but, uh, I don't think that's a, a probably a big issue for the home brewer. Okay, so um, going back to your business, you were gypsy brewing for a little while, right? And then uh, at some point, did you open a open your own place? No, we're still uh, we're still doing the gypsy brewing model. Okay. Um, we've gone from the smallest client at our breweries to probably one of the biggest, and we're adding a second location here in Calgary as well. So um, I think we like that model because. Um, Initially, I, th- I thought, okay, well, non-alcoholic beer, um, you know, it's, it's not going to be able to get as local as craft is. Craft, a big, a big component of craft and what makes it special is it gets very local. And I, yeah, having my a tasting, initial, tasting room and all that, you know. Yeah. And so for me, I originally had the idea that, you know, if we could be regional, that would be, that would be our version of local. And so we're looking to have a brewery in Eastern Canada, Western Canada, and then Eastern U.S. and, and Western U.S. So we think we think regional for us as a non a dedicated non alcoholic brewery um, will be our version of local. And uh, in order for us to do that, then the uh, contract brewing model is uh, is the right model for us. And how are you distributing it now? Are you do you have wholesalers? Are you working primarily off your website? Uh. Here in Canada, we're in all the large retailers, so we we sell direct to some of them. We use distributors in the U.S. We're in uh, all the Total Wine and more stores across the U.S. And we're in oh, Whole wow. Foods, that's great. Whole Foods, Whole Foods in the Pacific Northwest. So um, we're hoping to be national with them end of this year or early next year, uh, notwithstanding the uh, current uh, state of state of affairs in in both countries. But I mean, Total Wine is uh, is certainly widely available here in the U.S. So uh, I assume folks can find uh, find a lot of your products, right? Yeah, we have four of our SKUs there. So we have our IPA, our Pale Ale, our Blonde Ale, and our Stout. Well, that was actually my next question. What uh, what uh, particular styles are you making right now? So we're making those four. Plus, we've got a, a Red Ale that uh, is available through our our website exclusively at this point, and then we have a uh, Goza coming out uh, again uh, just through our website. Uh, that should be in the next two months. That's fantastic. Um, and the website, real quick. It's uh, drinkpartake.com. 
drink partake.com. It's par- partake, P-A-R-T-A-K-E, right? That's right. Yeah. So um, what are your future plans? And, and actually, how large is the system? How, mu- how much are you brewing now in a batch? So we're doing batches up to 250 barrels. And, um, you know, from, from a total uh, annual point of view, we're hoping this year to be at about 20,000 barrels. Although, you know, <laughs> forecasts right now are a little, a little wonky with COVID-19 uh, be, being here. But, yeah, it's uh, changed a little bit everything, I think. Uh, but uh, hopefully, uh, you know, with, with you being online and distributed, I, you know, you should, you should still be able to sell, I would think, right? Yeah, we're, we're fortunate in a way that, um, you know, we're, we're all in package. We, most of our sales go through retail, retail channels versus on-premise. So, um, you know, unfortunately for the on-premise business owners, it's, it's a very tough time right now. And, you know, we, we definitely had some partners there that are, are hurting or closing their doors. So, um, you know, it's, it, it's tough out there. Again, fortunately for us, we, we skew more towards retail, which seems to still be operating and working. So, mm-hmm. um, we're cautious, we're cautiously optimistic about the, the next few months ahead for us, but you know, things are changing, things are changing quickly these days. Yeah, it is a, it is a trying time. Are you, um, can you order online? I guess that's another question. I mean, can I, can I go on your website and order directly or? Sure. So both in, in Canada and the U S you can go to our website, you can order, uh, we do both a, uh, sell by the case of 24 cans, or, uh, we sell what we call a discovery pack. So it's one can of each of our five beers. So that's the, again, the IPA pale ale, blonde ale, uh, stout and red ale. And, uh, that's $15 delivered anywhere in the U S. That's fantastic. Um, Let's see. I actually want to go back to home brewing for a minute. So, do you have any advice for home brewers that are just getting into this? I know you, you know, you did the hundred or 20, 20, 30, 40 batches trying to get it. Um, any advice for folks that are trying to do this at home, you know, with simple equipment? Yeah, I, th- I think the, you know, what we talked about uh, brewing a regular percentage beer, uh, de alkalizing it on the stovetop with, with some heat, you know, that, that will get you there. Um, you know, it, it really depends. I think it's like any beer that a home brewer makes. It depends really how much interest they have in perfecting something. And so maybe it'll take 20 or 30% more time to perfect a non-alcoholic beer because it is a bit more delicate. Um, so I think if it's something you're really interested in, um, you know, you'll, they'll put in the time and, and uh, you know, I think it's worth it at the end. Are there certain ingredients you might use to, I, I mean, assume, assume you lose a lot of the body. Would you enhance the body by using, I don't know, wheat or, or, or things like that? Yeah, I, I think, I think those things would be Flake. helpful. I think, um, you know, we, we try to stay away from that from a, just a, a commercial point of view. We try to keep our ingredients as, as clean as possible. Not that wheat isn't clean, but just, um, it, it is an allergen for some people. So, um, you know, the, the criteria for us as a commercial I don't know, flake, brewer, flaked barley, things like that. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I think, I think if you're, if you're a little flexible on the alcohol content at the end of the day, um, then it, it gives you much more latitude to experiment and, and try to improve some of those aspects of the beer. And are there any home brewing resources for people that are looking to learn more about, uh, making non-alcoholic beer at home? I know you, you, you got into that for quite a while. Yeah, I, I don't know of anything specific to non-alcoholic beer home brewing. I'm, I've seen more stuff online, but um, off the top of my head, I, I couldn't uh, reference that for you uh, right now. But I think there's there's definitely more uh, chatter about it, and more um, uh, there are more um, people interested in it. Certainly, so I think there's a lot of knowledge being shared out there, and I think that's just typical of of home brewing. Is there a community or a group uh, for non-alcoholic beer drinkers? I, I don't know. There's quite a few fa- Facebook groups out there that are, are now dedicated to non-alcoholic beer or, or non-alcoholic uh, alternatives to, to alcohol. So that ex- could extend into non-alcoholic wines and, and spirits. Um, so, um, yeah, there's quite, a, there's quite a few out there. So um, just requires a, a simple Facebook search. 
Uh, where can folks learn more about Partake and, and what are your future plans? Uh, obviously, you know, things have been thrown into a little bit of chaos here, but. Uh... Yeah, so you can find out more about us at drinkpartake.com. We're on Instagram and, and Facebook as well. Um, our newsletter, we've got about 14,000 subscribers there. So, you know, we're sending out regular communications there, always some coupon codes and, and value added through uh, being a subscriber for us. Um, in terms of future plans, um, you know, we have the GOSA coming out. Uh, we have a few more, few more products in development that uh, uh, probably include uh, a Rattler, hopefully for summer. Um, we launch all of our new products through our website and try to get feedback from our, our online community. Um, so it's a nice uh, process where we get real-world feedback and our customers get, uh, our online subscribers get sort of first access to anything new we put out so it's um it's a great community that we've built and uh we get a lot out of them and hopefully they get a lot out of us in terms of future plans you know we'd love to be in um much larger retail distribution particularly in the u.s um and i think that'll that'll happen over the next 12 to 18 months awesome well, thank you, Ted. Um, I just want to have one quick, quick question at the end here. The Goza uh, is that how's uh, you know how's that worked out making a sour beer that's um, uh, that's also non-alcoholic? Yeah, like our, our early um, prototypes, I think are quite good. Um, I've gotten over the point where I think my my opinion of something is necessarily the right opinion. Um, so we'll put it out there and see what our what our cu- customers say, but. Um, yeah, we're just, uh, I, I guess we're a little fearless in that, you know, we'll try something, put it out to our customers. And if they like it, we'll scale it up and, and try to make it more available. And if they say it's, if it's terrible, then we'll, uh, we'll go back to the drawing board. But uh, well, I just think it's, I, I found it interesting, the whole idea of making a sour beer that's non-alcoholic, because um, obviously the sour is mainly lactic acid. It's not alcoholic by itself, right? The bacteria produces lactic acid. So. Yeah, so it's it's definitely uh, it, you know a lower pH, more acidic beer, and right. you know we're we actually had our our R and D facility shut down because of COVID, so we're probably going to commercial scale a little bit sooner than we would uh-huh. on this on this product. Um, but um, you know, I think I think our customers are are open to us trying new things. We haven't. We haven't gone back to the drawing board with anything we've put out. We've done some more sort of incremental improvements to things um, as they've been commercial. So we'll we'll see with this one if it uh, if it follows the same path or if it requires a bit more of a uh, of a, a redesign um, post uh, putting out to our customers. And Ted, uh, my last comment, I guess, uh, any thoughts on where the non-alcoholic beer brewing uh, industry is going as a whole? Uh, you mentioned there's an active uh, group uh, in Europe, obviously, and we have a couple big breweries here, but they don't necessarily produce the highest quality. Um, where do you think the industry's going? Yeah, I think, uh, well, before COVID anyways, you were, you were starting to see um, some of the regional craft brewers uh put out things in, in the non-alcoholic space. Um, you know, there's, there's this, there's these two kind of shiny objects right now for, for brewers. One is, um, things like uh, white claw and the, uh, seltzer business. And the other is seltzer is has maybe, been growing. Yeah. And then there's maybe non-alc as another potential future growth area, but, but I think a lot smaller than, than seltzer. So, um, you know, you've seen a few regional guys kind of put, put stuff out and dip their toe in. But uh, there are other companies like ours that make strictly non-alcoholic products and and some of them are making quite good good products as well. So um, I think there's just more variety out there for consumers. And I think as, you know, some of us early companies develop styles and flavors and, and make the category something people actually are considering as a, as a, as a beverage alternative, you know, we're just going to grow the category. And I think right now in North America, non-alc is less than 1% of the total beer market in Europe. It's about 5%. So I think, I think if we could get to that 5% over the next 10 years, um, that would be amazing. And I think the quality of products that are out there now suggest we can get there. And so, I mean, do you think there'll be sort of a mini craft beer revolution and non-alcoholic beer like we had uh, certainly on the commercial side get us away from things like Old Duels and some of the big brand names? 
I think so. Like in Europe, you can go to pretty much every tap room in Europe and you can get a non-alcoholic beer on tap. And I think that's just part of, it's just accepted. And I think we just need to, to get over the fact that beer can be good and it can be non-alcoholic at the same time. And so it should be something that, um, is acceptable socially. And I think when it does become acceptable socially, um, you'll see a lot more brewers bring it in as a, as a necessary option within their tap rooms and within, uh, on-premise establishments. Well, Ted, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate you being here. Uh, obviously a lot of knowledge and you're kind of leading the revolution here. Uh, so, so thank you for being here. Thanks for having me on, Brad. It was uh, a pleasure. Stay safe out there, Ted. Uh, again, my guest today was Ted Fleming, founder of Partake Brewing in Toronto, where he specializes in creating a wide range of alcohol-free beers. Thanks again, Ted. Thank you. Well, a big thank you to Ted Fleming for joining me this week. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They're currently offering 20% off their all-access subscription pass with access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com slash beersmith to get your all-access pass today. Again, that's beerandbrewing.com slash beersmith. And also the Brew Commander, the new complete brew house controller from Blickman Engineering. The patent-pending Brew Commander is a digital brew house controller with high precision and the ultimate in flexibility. The Brew Commander offers automated step mashing, boil timers, and advanced brew day settings. Command your brew day with a new Brew Commander from Blickman Engineering. To order yours today, go to BlickmanEngineering.com. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And Beersmith 3 is available on both desktop and mobile platforms. Beersmith 3 adds mead, wine, and cider recipe support, new whirlpool hop options for beer brewing, support for high altitude beer brewing, and a whole lot more. Check out Beersmith 3 and get your free 21-day trial today from Beersmith.com. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a great brewing week. Thank you.